Uh, first of all, I do want to thank you in particular to be here. Like the last speaker, it is so important uh, that we actually share with you the next, I would think, looking at you all, the next generation uh, of leaders and opinion makers. And I think for those of us who've had the experience, uh, sometimes when that experience is over, I think for your political colleagues, they in a way like to see you go over the hill and just be a faint memory because you never lose the ability to question where policy decisions are being made or how they are being taken. And sometimes you know what it's like when your mother questions your homework. I have an idea. I've kind of moved in uh, to that point, but I'm not your mother. Uh, so in that theme and that spirit, I do want to thank uh, the ICD for the invitation to be here. Uh, there are a lot of think tanks around, um, and really what they're doing is saying, I like to refer to myself as an ancien minister, which is the French way of dealing with uh, the older experienced people, and to be asked to come here and share my experience, but also know that at the end of the four days here, I think I'd prefer that we left Berlin uh, asking more questions than answers uh, we gave, because I think uh, that really is where you'll be able to go back and challenge where you've come from. Uh, the world is changing. It's changing so rapidly we can only suspect uh, where it's going. And I, own, I use the word um, suspect because the unprecedented change is enormous. I was fortunate enough to be invited on the 8th of February 20 years ago to come with a parliamentary delegation to help to knock down the wall in Berlin. It was a wonderful experience and I brought a genuine bag of stones home. And I always promised I'd come back, but actually just never quite made it. But if I look now just at the physical structure of Berlin and what has happened in 20 years, it really is a challenge to, to say or recognise that I have no idea what 20 years' time uh, is going to look at. And that was something that I go back to, and I think the year that I was in Amsterdam, 1997, with the Council of Ministers here, that's just reminding you of that, what this is about in the EU. And we were apportioning out investment in new technology. Uh, we were earmarking money for nuclear investment in European Union countries. Uh, and we were doing it at a time when Google or Facebook, I think, hadn't been invented. Certainly, we had never heard the words. We talked then of a minimum of one computer per classroom. Now, many of you are sitting there. I mean, we never heard of the mobile phone, of course, but you're actually there with a virtual computer in your, your pockets now. Um, and I did say out loud, um, how, how were we preparing the student for the new age? And this was the image I used, uh, Alibaba, which is one of the tales of the Arabian Nights. And you know the whole story, if you know it was, how could this poor man access this enormous wealth? And all he had to do was to learn the words, open sesame. He had learned the words, and then the cave was his. But what worried me was, I mean, this is the school teacher in me coming out, what skills did Ali Baba have to know? Which jewel was worth? Which gold was genuine? What use to his family would be if he rifled the bit in this part of the cave or let his wife into that part of the cave? And I would think, you know, the, what we were aware we were on the cusp of a new age, but at that stage, we were learning computer language, how to program our computers, and the language was called BASIC. And the other thing that I remember clearly, all the paper we used on our computers was serrated. You had to physically pull uh, the papers apart. So really looking at what we were going to do for the children, the education challenges and tra uh, training that was necessary as we, the Council of Ministers of Europe, were apportioning out investment money was actually uh, something 
that we really didn't know and couldn't know a lot about. Now, I, at that stage, was involved in writing a white paper for education, for the Irish education system. Uh, I did have to explain the reason of the titling, the title to some maybe older civil servants. And it, I called it Charting Our Education Future because I did have a son who was a Trekkie fan. Star Trek was invented at that stage. Uh, and the idea was, if you remember the, the words, it's, you know, a spaceship that was ready to boldly go where no man had gone before. And I loved this idea that here was I spelling out education, our dreams for education, our pathways was investment, uh, and again, and I'll just remind you the words that still, you know, I know we didn't know anything about broadband, Google, YouTube, Facebook, and I'm actually beginning to Twitter. I think I've promised I'll begin to Twitter after uh, this weekend. So there was I. I was charting out a future which was to reform uh, an 80 year old very classical education system and I was actually also to widen access to education and that's where I abolished the fees to undergraduate third level students but it still remains uh, very controversial in Ireland today. So in today's world we've got our uh, and what we are going education system and training that we're putting in place uh, is one that will actually allow us uh, to be judged, not against our past experience, but against our global competitors. Mass education is how we describe it, not the education for the elite. I was educated in a Catholic convent school where we were told we were being educated to be the elite of tomorrow. Now, I think... It might still be going on, but I don't actually think anyone has the nerve to describe Western education systems uh, quite in those words today. Um, not, uh, and I would say the big priority for us is that we want to put in place an environment of learning and training that commits itself to academic freedom. That would be priority one. And the minute you say that, then you have to say that that's actually not a great priority in any research I've seen coming from the Pacific Rim, where the newly industrialized economies and the latest little letters that were jumping up at me, the NIEs, somebody might know how that actually said, but they've been able to successfully change the traditional hierarchy of education excellence. But there, it is in a different environment. It is under a different total philosophy. It is where uh, the political elite are free and can uh, take decisions. Civil society and its leaders, whether from the poorest of communities to the richest of capitalists, whether we are talking about um, small villages, whether we are talking about South America that has been referenced here today, um, we are all mesmerized by today's financial collapse. And, uh, in think tanks, the team, themes are being look, looked at, and really we're seeking a way forward. We're seeking out the pathways to recover. And again, I want to say to you, that's what, in a way, I see my attendance here, it is to stimulate that. So that stimulate your uh, challenge of what pathways will lead us uh, to a better future. Well, it has to be a different future. Uh, so, I would, the number of issues that I'm raising, actually these are, we go back, I've said academic freedom, I look at some of the Ireland's education and training, and uh, the education and training for the global economy, because I think there are two very different philosophies battling it out there, and then and I describe myself as an old-fashioned feminist, it's not fashionable to say you're a feminist, but I think you're allowed to call yourself an old-fashioned feminist, uh, and I would actually make reference uh, to the girl effect, which, and I'll just say about the girl effect, it's a term I use, and was used in Davros, so there's something maybe old-fashioned feminism is catching up uh, with tomorrow's answers. So, in the, the number, these will be the number of issues raised. Uh, the Nash Irish Education Training um, 
we have a Competitiveness Council, and the Competitiveness Council pours out uh, advice and information for us, and in the words of its chairman, without a world class education and training system, we have great difficulty in succeeding in the face of intensifying global competition and in protecting recent increases in our living standards. Those recent increases are certainly under threat in Ireland, but like other countries, we are busy um, focusing on that. Uh, then, I, from my experience of government, I know how important it is actually to be challenged in a uh, fora like this. And I think the biggest and most interesting challenge is that actually people in the political world who are the non-experts uh, actually are warned against rogue experts because there's many a rogue expert with many a rogue theory uh, that can dress it up nicely uh, and sell it. David Ashton in the University of Leicester in the UK has published with Francis Green a book. Uh, the book actually and my paper have the same name. I wasn't aware of this, but Education Training and the Global Economy, and I will refer to that. And then I'll finish by uh, looking at uh, the girl effect and again, there's a bit of work there. Alison Walhorse at Britain's Warwick uh, Business School actually has done some work there. And if you're interested in pursuing that, uh, she's the expert on it, uh, not me. So off we go into planning for tomorrow's world. And de the debate ranges third and fourth level. But I want to go back a little bit and I want to talk about the environment in which this education and training um, takes place, because I would think now Alibaba's cave is open. I think we all have enormous free access to probably a bottomless pool of knowledge, because invention we can never put a step, a step on. And the text, the formula, and the thesis are online, uh, and not on serrated pages, uh, on PAMs, iPads. I mean, the world, even the vocabulary has changed since... January uh, in this year. So the school curricula, curricula what is that doing? Uh, governments recognise, and they say it over and over again, and we're due a few more manifestos for new governments soon, and they will talk about the wisdom of giving all students the capacity to drive economic progress. Uh, but then I have to say, look, you know, in saying that, are we giving enough resources or changes in the pedagogy to ensure that actually there are skill sets that um, the students will actually be able to come out and we we'll move our way uh, towards that uh, file? I think actually at this stage, I'd love to see if I was writing a white paper again, if I was taking up office in any Ministry of Education, actually a global comparativeness study done on the outcomes of pedagogical uh, ways. Because I think we're, you know, we have too much to learn. And if we are harking back and we are building on an 80, 800 year old classical education system, there really is uh, a lot to learn. But we have to learn this, and I'm going to take that back off your screen. Uh, we're going to have to learn this by looking at the environment in which all education, innovation, and training takes place. And I just want to draw a name to your attention, and you may not agree at all with this thesis, Jonathan R. Cole of Columbia. Uh, University in the USA. He's actually questioning, and the debate is quite heated, uh, the capacity of American research, their universities, to remain the most powerful engine of innovation and discovery, because that's where the Americans are, and that's where the Americans see themselves. But he's actually saying the future isn't only about money. Before we talk about money, we are in a danger of throwing away our excellence, because those at the top of the education ladder usually um, paint the picture of uh, diminishing or lowering standards around funding uh, the financial cuts to university. But what Cole has asked us, yesterday's leaders and tomorrow's leaders, is to ensure that the freedom of academia academia is protected and he actually points to the difficulties in the US following 9-11 where 
uh, their excellence may be undermining, uh, in particular about difficulty of visas, allowing that free traffic of excellence uh, to enter, participate in the university sector uh, to stay or to leave again. So that's something that's certainly out there, and I would suggest there are people here who don't agree with him, but he will talk uh, in a thesis that addresses global terrorism and not one that addresses the global needs in education uh, and training. Now, on to Ireland, where you see us. We're here, number 25 on that list, and you might find your own uh, countries there, and a lot of your countries are before mine. Uh, the work that's going on with Dr. John Thornhill, uh, and it is actually calling on the government in very difficult times, and I'm sure your crisis is worse than ours, but I think ours crisis is probably worse uh, than yours. But these are very... Uh, challenging times when you're looking for investment into the future. So he's actually calling on the government to be as ambitious in their expectation of the third level sector where we now have uh, with the intellectual capacity to do it, but we've actually opened the gates um, for everybody who wants to participate at undergraduate level there. Where the climate economy is poor, according to the Council, there are targets that must be set out and there must be priorities earmarked and they must be measured uh, by the government. So taking targeted funding uh, the necessity, and they've done a bit of work on the necessity of putting that into primary education, and we're atrociously and notoriously weak on pre-primary education, but that's another paper. Uh, what the targets that are set out here and are actually placed on the agenda for us in Ireland is that our students develop the critical skills they're familiar with team working because the way of working in itself has changed. The ability to communicate, which I think certainly the speakers before me uh, showed the importance of that. And then actually in order to be prepared for the world that we don't know about but we know is coming around the corner, the task of taking on the responsibility, uh, self-directed learner skills. And that actually is something... You learn over life and by, you know, you acquire these skills, but really we want to shortchange it and we want you uh, to have those skills as you start out. So these are all the necessary ingredients of the recommendations. They're terribly serious, but I will be honest with you, and I suppose I put it in the type script and I'd be told maybe I shouldn't, but we have a very prestigious uh, newspaper in Ireland, the Irish Times, that knows how to run the country better than everybody else. And they said in a lead uh, editorial uh, just a couple of weeks ago that uh, when the report landed on the desk said, ah, oh, listen, great report. It's the way we should be doing uh, our business. But let's warn you, in the past, governments have put these kind of reports up on the shelves and they've been allowed to gather dust. And I think that's sort of, that's a responsibility I have to make sure to go back and make enough noise that at least the dust gets a little bit raised on that debate. Now moving uh, from Ireland, and we move off to, I've mentioned him already, uh, David Ashton, and uh, this is the cover of the book, all the things you can find on Google, and uh, it's David Ashton and Francis Green, and they're talking there about the ready supply, you know, this argument, if we educate enough people, and it is an argument that successfully repaid investment in Ireland in the past, but we're actually talking and worrying about the future. And this, he has a theory, he's a sociologist and he's much more interdisciplinary than you normally find from economists who are just uh, planning on spend. But he actually um, asks us to question the accepted theory that a ready supply of graduates automatically creates the demand necessary to employ them. And he asks us to look at that seriously. Um, and I think that's maybe something you might think about. Um, do we in the end have a pool of graduates, so many, that the level of conversation in your McDonald's is quite philosophical. Um, now, that might be very good for the people in McDonald's, but is that uh, the way we're going? So according to Ashton and Francis Green, um, who 
is the co-writer or the co-worker in this, uh, what they're saying is they want, uh, they want us to question where we are putting the, uh, our investment and where it is to go to, uh, a multidisciplinary approach because that's their own approach and uh, saying we're doing an awful lot of work and this is where they really opened my eyes, I think, to the work that was being done and how it was being done in the newly industrialised economies, the NIEs, uh, where they were actually a to look at what we were doing in the, in the West, emulate it, and then produce trained workforces, which they would say now um, can be compared to the workforces of Germany and Japan. And how can that happen, and why aren't we doing the same? Eastern governments, and I think somebody has said it earlier, they don't have the democracy, the dem democratically accountability that anybody standing for office has, uh, certainly in Europe, but I don't speak any wider. You stand for election. Your peers, your neighbours, your enemies and your friends, they vote for you. And then as a non-expert generally, because we have a system where ministers do not resign on being appointed ministers, they continue to represent um, the people who have elected them and in the meantime have a dual role of being uh, a minister. Now that's the sort of thing, it actually doesn't happen in Norway, I know for sure, and I know experts can be appointed ministers in other European countries, but the general thing, uh, democracy can play a very heavy hand when it comes to the introduction of change. So looking at the NIEs, these countries, the newly emerged countries, uh, and saying, you know, they were at a time low-skill workforce, then with little added value in a high-value uh, economy, but with the attraction of multinationals in, then the political elite, or the ruling elite, because maybe not even using the word political, but the ruling elite decided to absolutely take uh, charge of what was happening and overnight uh, targeted their education budgets massively on the workforce, uh, on the adult in, uh, in the workforce. So while we were, and I mean it's a very traditional way of doing it, earmarking money for preschool and schooling and the development of the full um, person, these countries caught up with us and actually passed out uh, a lot by concentrating uh, on workplace investment. So the education system, if that was to happen in my country, we have so many stakeholders, you'd lose the election. Um, you have the tax-paying parents, you have the teachers, you have their unions, you have the opposition, you have the owners of our religious schools. These are all partners in the education um, exercise. And if we were actually to bring in changes overnight, and I, mean, I abolished free education to third level 1996, and it's still featuring in a debate. The Greens saved it uh, the last time, uh, and that was just recently. So what, what you have to do now is to say, what's the difference? And to me, I come back to Confucius. He was already uh, mentioned. These are your NIEs, just Hong Kong, South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan, Thailand, China, Malaysia, and that gets added to depending, specific RIM um, gets different sort of lists, but these were the ones. Singapore, I was always being told about uh, as a minister, what Singapore could do. And I was thinking, where is Singapore and what could they do? I'm here for a limited length of time uh, in a democratic government, fighting my place at cabinet against people who much stronger because they were ministers for agriculture. Uh, so here you were and you were being told, look, the universities were great at coming in and telling you, Minister, look at Singapore. Um, but I don't, they might be the last institutions to actually take it from the top down, any change that might be done. Because this is what it was actually looking at Confucius. And the difference is we actually battle in the West with the right of the individual. You know, this is my right. I can dress how I like. I can study what I like. I can be a vegetarian or a bovine eater. I, I have rights and they're terribly important. And they are actually something that we will go out and we will march about the most well, we do, we <laughs> occupy ourselves on a Saturday afternoon with handfuls of people who are demonstrating for the right of people to be different. And then you look at 
What is the difference if we were in a framework or had uh, imbibed or imbued the philosophy of Confucius? Confucius? Confucius puts the common good first. And you can do what you like down there. You know, you have a role, you have a responsibility. Uh, it's very earmarked, but the common good. So that when you are in a situation, I was deciding a parking regime recently and 32 residents voted and four voted against it. And the four that lost the plebiscite are still causing me more problems because they have no idea that when they got a plebiscite and they were given the right to vote about parking your car outside your house, that when four neighbours didn't like the idea that that actually wasn't enough to say, hang on, you didn't know about Confucius because actually uh, you shouldn't be picking up that kind of you know, this is the common good. So we are really looking at two quite competing philosophies. On one hand, I thought about uh, really, in a way, making policy under a Confucius system is, to me, a hothouse. And I'd love to be the gardener in there. And then on the other hand, you have Cole uh, in Colombia who's saying anybody who differs, even people who are threatening us in a way, Having their input is so important that we actually need to defend it. And I think some of those academics are having a very rough ride. And there is a big debate going on in England as well uh, about the student visas and the right of people to do research. Now, Confucius or no Confucius, girls still didn't figure anywhere. So I'm just putting this up for my last piece that I'm going to draw attention to you. This was a French niece of mine on an aid program in Nepal, gathering the stories that their grandmothers told them, because, of course, once you put the tie on them and they went to school, there was a chance all this was going to be lost. But anyway, the girl, she was one of these wonderful aid projects that uh, are in place, and she was delighted to hear I was bringing her, her painting here today. But if you look at what we could do with the girl effect, I just want to mention in particular uh, the work done in Warwick. And to say to you, I've already told you I'm a feminist, but this is not about feminism. This is actually about economics. Because if the NIEs could target uh, and turn their education systems around so rapidly, why can't... Uh, some of those global institutions that we me mentioned already actually do the same. We're looking at 600 million girls in the third world that are totally outside any count. Uh, and we are saying, uh, because research has showed us that if we actually educate these girls, and these have got as far as the tie, so they must be on their way, they will actually marry later. They'll have much fewer children. They will actually make an income for themselves, for whatever, but they will. And because it is a girl and a woman's world, 90% of that income will go back into their own families. So if you just think about the effect, if we could do that with some other areas of investment that we do, that is a massive return for something that hasn't really seriously been counted up to this. So uh, Alison Warhouse, she did, there's a www.girleffect.org and she looks at some um, projects there and there's one figure that I just thought as a way of an example, 25 billion investment. If it was put into a girls program, it could re give you a return of 27.4 billion. So that you know, I want you to leave Berlin remembering, you know, that woman who got up and talked about girls and feminism because, it, well, I can do it with a sense of warmth and hope and, you know, my dream of tomorrow. Uh, CARES CEO Hel Helena Gale talked about educating girls needs some of the highest returns in development, uh, investment, and the World Bank, and I think it's worth quoting the World Bank's own back at them, uh, Okonja Awila, who said, and I think this is a lovely expression, investing in women is smart economy. 
investing in girls, catching them upstream, is even smarter economics. So there's always an economic argument to doing something new and something different. So I'm just going to finish by putting old Alibaba up to know are you any the wiser or I am the wiser of what particular treasure in this cave um, we should be going. Uh, certainly I didn't and don't have the skill set to... Uh, pass a course over what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. But just to say to you, the future is passing so rapidly out there, the snow will even have melted by the time we leave. And you uh, people who are going back to participate in debates where new uh, generations of leaders are emerging, I certainly would hope, have questions that you can ask and find others that you can bring in and uh, to give those answers. Thank you very much.